Welcome to Southgate. I am so glad that you are joining us here today to take in this teaching. Uh, I just, I, I wanted to take some time to welcome you, but to also invite you to participate in what we are doing. We are going through a series called By Request, and uh, we are taking your requests for past sermons that you would like to hear revisited, uh, maybe with some fresh insight. Um, we would love to hear what are some of the things that you want us to talk about. And so uh, this series that is going on over the summer is going to be led and kind of directed by uh, the people of Southgate. And so we want to hear from you. Uh, please take an opportunity to fill out one of our forms to uh, submit a request. Uh, and we'll be looking through those and picking out which ones uh, we think are going to fit well with the direction of the summer. And so we really want to thank you in advance for participating with us in that. And we also invite you to participate financially in what is going on uh, with the church. Uh, we are able to do the things that we can do in our community and online um, because of your generous giving. And so if you feel led to uh, join the family in that way, uh, there are many different ways that you can do that. They'll be up on the screen here. And I, I, I just want to thank you in advance. Thank you for those of you who are uh, helping us financially. Uh, we just really believe that that is an opportunity to serve God in uh, that way, to not hold on to something, but rather to give it to be on mission. And so we are about to start our service and we're going to engage in some worship time and then we are going to have a teaching. And so I just want to open us up in a word of prayer before we begin. God, thank you so much for this opportunity, uh, for this space, for this place uh, to, to come together. And I just pray, God, that as we unpack your word, as we engage with uh, the things that you have been saying and doing throughout history, I pray, God, that your wisdom would guide us, would lead us, and that ultimately we would grow into the people that you have created us to be. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.
All right, so we are in this series called By Request, and this, in this series, you get to pick what we're going to be talking about all summer long, and wherever you are, you can send the request into the church and let us know what you want us to talk about. You can pick sermons from the past that were you know, impactful for you or you want to hear again. You can pick topics or scripture, whatever you want, but all summer long, this is kind of the direction that we're going, so you decide. Now, the person who submitted this request, they, they wanted to go back to a series called Leap of Faith. And Leap of Faith is where we talked about taking Pascal's wager and this idea that at some point you have to jump out into the unknown. And this idea that there's three different ways that people are. You are either an advocate of what you believe, or you are an agnostic, or you are an atheist. And today we're going to be talking about one of those specific categories or labels <clears throat> that sometimes we find ourselves in. Now, several years ago, someone in the church, they gifted us with a trampoline. And uh, man, we, we never thought we'd get a trampoline. We didn't want a trampoline. And then we got this trampoline, and it was awesome. I mean, it, having three boys, the trampoline is huge at our house. It gets used all the time. And they actually used it so much that they wore it out. We got another one. And so now we have another trampoline. It's a little more, a little more safe than the, than the other one. But my kids love jumping on it. They use it almost every day. Uh, oftentimes the end result is a little bit of crying because someone got hurt, right? You always get hurt on the trampoline. But, uh, but here's kind of the, the scenario of what goes on on that trampoline. Here's a slow-mo of my oldest son, Brayson, jumping just this morning. So check this out. All right, so he is jumping. He loves to get huge air. He does all kinds of tricks that sometimes are a little scary, but he jumps, does all kinds of tricks on this thing, and the boys love it. They play basketball on it and uh, wrestle on it and tickle on it. I mean, all kinds of stuff. But I can remember that that my the first time my kids called my wife, Emily, out to watch us on the trampoline, and uh, they wanted to show her what they had discovered, and what they had discovered was the double bounce, all right, double bounce, and so they were, they, you know, up to this point, they were jumping, they were having fun, they were getting air, it's, it's a great exercise, but then, and then Emily comes out, and we show her this double bounce, and we timed it exactly right so that Brayson was jumping on the trampoline, and at just the right time, I did a jump, which something happens in the space-time continuum and his 50 pounds at the time of body went flying up into the air, not just like a few feet off the ground. He went way up in the air. You can imagine cats as they just fly through flailing. That's what he was like way up high and he's just like suspended there and Emily's watching and I'm watching and the other boys are watching until he comes crashing down and at the same time, Brayson looks at my wife as I look at my wife, kind of to see her reaction. And um, it wasn't it wasn't pleasant. It wasn't the best reaction. She didn't have the best reaction at the time. But uh, her advice to us was like, never do this again. This is not a this is not a good thing. Someone's going to get hurt. And so please don't do this again and just normal bounce on the trampoline to which I said, no problem. We will not do this again until she went back inside the house. And then we double bounced again and we're jumping on the trampoline and seeing the kids fly through the air. And it's, it's interesting that we highlight the trampoline because, because really it, it points us to this idea of where God starts to make sense for us. Because when it comes to faith, you have to have faith that the landing is going to be there. You have to have faith in something. Everyone believes in something. Everybody. People often tell me that they could never have the faith of a, of a believer, of, a, of an advocate. They couldn't do that. They, they don't have the, the foundations. They, they really couldn't go there because it's too hard. And the idea that some people have faith and other people don't have faith 
It is a very popular kind of viewpoint, but it's not true. Everyone does. Everyone believes and everyone is following something. Everyone follows something. Our theme verse for today is this, Hebrews 11 verse 1. It reads like this. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Now, the question that, that we really need to ask here is, is it rational to believe that God exists? Is that a rational concept? To believe that God exists. Further, is it irrational to believe that he doesn't exist? It's, 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 a, it's a puzzling question. And, and, and really, we, we have this understanding that there's only two real possible ways to live. Either as God exists, or that he doesn't exist. There's no in-between. You either jump all in or you are all out. There's no in-between of belief. But the father of lies would really love us to believe that there is a third option. There's something more. There's other possible paths that we could take that don't have to be all in one direction or all in on the other. And really what he uses for that is something called the agnostic the agnostic. But, but let's define the three different terms here. The first one we want to define is the advocate. What is the advocate? The advocate is a person who publicly supports or recommends a particular cause or policy. So I'm an advocate of the faith. I'm an advocate of what I believe. I'm an advocate of the Bible. I'm an advocate of what God has done in my life. I'm an advocate of what he can do in yours. I, I'm, I'm really all about it. I'm all in, right? That's what an advocate is. Let's define what an atheist is. An atheist is this, a person who disbelieves or lacks belief in the existence of God or gods. Now, if we take a look at that and we take a look at the advocate, and now we get a better understanding of what the agnostic is, an agnostic is quite a controversial subject because it's hard to point down exactly what it is. The exact definition of what it means to be an agnostic. And that's because there, there really isn't one. It's just so wishy-washy. It's kind of all over the place. But I can tell you what agnostics thinks they know and, and how they would probably define themselves. Now let me give you this definition of an agnostic. It's this. A person who believes that nothing is known or can be known of the existence or nature of God or of anything beyond material phenomena. A person who claims neither faith nor disbelief in God. Now in Canada, it is difficult. We all understand as believers, we would understand that it is difficult in Canada to, to, to be an advocate for people the society that we live in to accept and to understand an advocate. Because the way that the media, the way that pop culture, the way that the government, even the way that the school system would portray uh, the, the advocate, it's, it's not something that people want to fall in love with being. The, the viewpoints is, is, is almost extreme sometimes it's labeled. The, the thoughts or the concepts of what we believe in the Bible is sometimes communicated that it could not be trusted. It is barbaric. It is, it is so old. It is, it is historical stuff. It, it, it's no longer relevant and so should be abandoned. And to say that you're an advocate of any religion is really a sensitive subject in today's culture in Canada, specifically here in eastern Ontario. And so the easiest way to address this, and not to be an advocate or labeled as an advocate, and at the same time having some kind of belief, but not wanting to be an atheist, the easiest way to go about that is to be an agnostic. That I don't have to be one way or the other. When it fits, when the time is right, then yes, I can identify in whatever way that I want to move in. 
But really, what it is, is it's, it's not a belief in, in, in nothing or to unexplain or whatever it is. It, it really is a challenge because what it means is that you have a, a lack of knowledge. Agnosticism is a, is a lack of knowledge. See, the reason atheism and theism have to be religious viewpoints is that, is that they, they ultimately believe in something. They, they believe this is how things are. So they're, they're all in one direction or another, but if you're an agnostic, you really don't have a direction. You don't have anything to set your, to set your feet on. See, what the agnostic believes is that he or she, they, they sit on the fence between belief and unbelief. They, they pick and choose some things and not other things, depending when it fits or how it fits. And we'll get to that in a moment. So what we tried to do here is take a look in the Bible and to see how, where, where there was an individual who was an agnostic. Where do we find that in the Bible? What is, what is the best case scenario of someone who is an agnostic? And can we look at this and see what was the result of believing that way? And we find one here in John 18 and 19. John 18 and 19. Now, let me set the stage for you. What is taking place here is that in the last hours before Jesus' death, right before he goes to the cross, he spends significant time with his disciples. They're in the, the, they, they, they go to an upper room. They're eating dinner together. He's explaining what is, what is about to take place. They, they take communion together, the, the Lord's Supper. They take the bread and the juice. They share it. And he does something significant. He washes his disciples' feet, which is normally meant for the lowest member of the household or of society. He washes each of their feet, including Judas Iscariot. And as they're, as they're sharing this meal together, Judas leaves in the middle of the meal and he heads off and he's going to betray Jesus. He's going to go to the authorities and get them to come and arrest Jesus. After the foot washing, they, 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 they continue on with their communion and he shares with them, alluding to his death about the bread and what it represents and the, his blood and what it represents. And in the middle of this, when they're finished, the disciples, they go to the Garden of Gethsemane and they begin to pray. And Jesus is praying so intently and he asks the disciples to stay up and to pray with him, but they can't stay awake and they fall asleep. And in the middle of that night, as Jesus is praying, lo and behold, Judas, who left in the middle of the meal, he comes with a crowd to arrest Jesus. While they're in the garden, they arrest him. They accuse him of blasphemy. They put him on trial. Jesus is interrogated. He is beaten. He is spit on. He is mocked. And we pick up the story as we find out Jesus' fate. And so we're going to pick up the story here in John 18, 28. And really what is taking place is that we have, we have this man named Pilate, this interaction between him and Jesus and a crowd. And the first section of this, these first few verses, they take place outside, all right? And so here's what is happening here in John 18, 28 and 29. It says, Then the Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanliness, they did not enter the palace because they wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and asked, what charges are you bringing against this man? And so this guy named Pilate, he, he is in a difficult scenario. He's faced with the, the harsh reality of going all in, in one direction or the other. Outside, he has an angry mob who wants Jesus crucified. Inside, he has Jesus, who is usually calm and collected and, 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 and understanding. And he knows what he's up against. And in this passage, Pilate goes outside to address the crowd of, uh, uh, of, of what is going on here. And so we pick up the story here as we go inside and Pilate asks some questions to Jesus after he's been outside. And so inside in 1833 to 38, it says this, Pilate 
then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked? Or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you've done? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone is on the side of truth, listens to me. What is truth? retorted Pilate. And so he's had this conversation with Jesus inside here, this one-on-one, -on -one, but then but then we go outside again and Pilate finds Jesus not guilty in 1838 to 40. And it reads like this. With this, he went out again to the Jews, gathered there and said, I find no basis for a charge against him, but it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back. No, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now, Barabbas had taken part in an uprising. And so Barabbas was actually guilty here. And they wanted the guilty man. They did not want Jesus. And so uh, this is an interesting thing, right? Because he's outside. Pilate is about to go back inside. And he's telling the soldiers in this next passage to go and to whip Jesus. In 19, 1 to 3, it reads like this. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they slapped him in the face. And so, this is what is taking place Inside, but then we go outside again and Pilate finds Jesus not guilty. And so he says this, once more Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and purple robe, Pilate said to them, here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, crucify, crucify. But Pilate answered, you take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders insisted, we have a law and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid. And then Pilate goes back inside, all right? Pilate talks with Jesus about the power that Pilate has, all right? He's telling Jesus, this is the power I have. And he says this in 9 to 11. And he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from, he asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me, Pilate said? Don't you realize I have the power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. See, this is an amazing thing here, right? This is, a, this is, a, this is an amazing thing as, as there's like this power struggle taking place and Pilate doesn't really know what to do with this. He knows he has this mob outside. He knows Jesus is saying this and yet Pilate like, doesn't, doesn't know what to do. And so he goes back outside finally here. And he says this. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free. But the Jewish leaders kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out, sat down on the judge's seat, with a place known as the stone pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said. 
to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. See, at this point, your neck probably hurts, right? Back and forth, either side, in and out. Pilate, you're driving us nuts. It seems like you're not going to make a decision. You're going one way or another, depending what's popular. If it's outside or inside, you're, you're, you're kind of playing this crazy game. And Pilate, eventually, he rejects Jesus. His, his, his otherworldly kingdom that Jesus claims, the truth that Jesus claims in his life, he, he, he's, he, Pilate rejects this and he's left responding to the pressures of our world. He doesn't like the alternatives offered to him by Jesus or by the opponents, but he's being forced to decide one way or the other. And in the midst of that, in the moment, from the pressures of society, he caves. See, here's a picture of dualism. This is something that we deal with every day. It's found throughout Scripture that God and Satan, they, they, they are, they, they're vying for, for you. That every square inch, every second of our lives... Is claimed. It's, it, it's one way or the other. It's, there's no in between. There's no gray. One takes it or the other, and the choice, the choice is ours. Each of us faces the challenge that Pilate faces. And we might be able to avoid it now and then or throughout the days of our lives, but eventually you will, you will have to decide. And as an agnostic, you've believed the lie that you are playing it safe. But ultimately, like Pilate, your indecision makes a decision. You can't sit on the fence. You, you, you have to be one side or the other. You cannot stay in the middle. And so let's go back to that trampoline, that, the idea of the trampoline. See, a few facts about trampolines here. Is that, is that trampolines need to have solid footings. They need to have solid ground. You can't have it on an angle or, or on a sandy place or, or sitting, uh, you, know, you can't have these legs in the water, nothing like that. It has to be solid. And this is your belief. It represents the, the truth of what you believe. You need to have that sound footing, that sound foundation of, of what you know. And then there are upright supports. These are the frameworks of what you believe. These are the, the core values that you, that you hold on to, the truths of the Word of God, the core tenets of our faith and what we believe. These make up your faith. You have the foundation. You have these uprights, these core values. And then you have the mat, the, the, the frame that's held together by, by the springs. It's, it's the theology that we all share together of, of, of our understanding of God to try to understand him better. And we have the church that, that is there for one another, living out these one another commands, and, and it holds us up. And, and, and as we go here, we get higher and higher towards God to understand him better. And, and with all these things in place, we are able to jump higher towards him in our walk with him. But you still can't get to the heights that you are capable of getting to. See, what you need is the double bounce. You need an external force to propel you upwards higher than you ever thought you could go on your own. This, this, this will take you high, but you need the double bounce, a force of a dad or a father force of God in your life to at just the right time to propel you upwards towards him to do things with him you never thought possible before. See, the, the ultimate truth is that you can't have it both ways. You can't have it all. It kind of reminds me of, of the Mandarin. If you know me, you will, you will know that I enjoy going to the Mandarin. Now, this is not an everyday thing. This is not an every month thing. 
this is maybe a once a year thing that I will like to go to the Mandarin. And the beauty about the Mandarin is, man, it is comfy. It's a nice spot. You got fish tanks over here. You got someone waiting on you, bringing you stuff. You can go and you can say, you know what? I want to eat those shrimp and I don't want to eat that salad. I, I don't want, I want to go have some steak. I want to have some sushi. I want, yeah, I want to just go pick whatever I want to eat. And then the stuff I don't want to eat, I'm just going to leave. Or I'm going to eat as much as I want. And then there's like stuff I don't like. I'm not going to eat it. I'm going to go get more. And it is like, it's borderline sin. I mean, you just go and you're eating, you're picking, you're choosing, smorgasbord of all kinds of stuff. But listen, this is the, the reason why I say this is that, is that I have never, ever left the Mandarin and been like, man, I feel good. I, I never feel good after the Mandarin. I never feel good. I, I've, I've picked and choose. I got everything I wanted. And then I leave and I'm like, I shouldn't have done that. I should, I'm, I'm paying, I'm going to pay for this for a while. This doesn't feel good on my body, right? And, but this is, this is what we're doing as we go through our lives, as we're living this thing out in society. We are afraid to actually take a stand one way or the other. And we go to church and we pick out the things that we want and we throw away the things that we don't want. And we have people telling us this stuff is right in society or we should do this or don't do this or that's barbaric or that's old school or whatever it is. And so we, we, we're like, yeah, yeah, I believe that. Yeah, it feels good or whatever in the moment. I, I'm going to pick that. And then I'm going to leave this thing out and I'm going to rip this page out of the Bible. I don't like that. And no, I don't believe that and whatever. We are way more modern. It's 2022 now. And, and it doesn't end well. That's what I'm saying here. Indecision is a decision. And so let's take a look at the, the next steps here. How, how, how do we learn from this? Where do we go? A few quick things. Very, very simple. Number one. Identify a place where you have allowed indecision to make a decision for you. The pressures of the world, your family, your spouse, your, your kids, your, your, your workplace, whatever, they're, they're, they're saying things to you and you, you are afraid to stand up for what you believe or stand on the truth of what you really do know inside or, and, and you haven't made a decision. You won't stand firm in it. Number two, make a decision. To step towards being an advocate. Maybe you're, you're an atheist. You still believe in something. It takes a lot of belief to be an atheist. And maybe you step, you step towards, towards that. Towards being an advocate. Maybe you're an agnostic and you pick and chose. And, and you don't know exactly what you believe. And, and you're afraid to stand on one side or the other. Take a step towards being an advocate. It's the best thing for you. To stand firm in who God has made you to be and what he's called you to do. And so let me pray for just that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I, I just pray here for your calling on our lives, God. This is not a, there's no gray scale here. This is just a, a one way or the other issue, God. And we want to, we want to represent you well, God. We want to go deeper uh, in our relationship and, and, and really higher than we ever have before towards you and, and what you'd have for us, God. I'm just praying for, for people who are, who are with us here today as they struggle with understanding this or taking a stand or, or deciding one way or the other. Father, I'm just praying that you would be more than enough, that you, they would be strong enough, God, and that through your Holy Spirit, they would, they would be able to be an advocate for you, what you've done in their lives and for your word. And I thank you for the hope and the truth that we can stand in in an ever-changing, an ever-chaotic, crazy world. God, we love you and we pray these things in your name. Amen.